Well, hello, uh, Todd Abbott here, uh, Tanner, um, who is a good good friend and good partner. Um, really excited to share uh, some insights with you. Uh, we're going to get started in about thirty seconds or so. Just want to give some uh, some folks who are late coming off their last uh, Zoom meeting, which is the world we live in now. Um, and let me just pull up the slides while we're getting ready. Um, and then we'll do some official introductions uh, for both myself and Tanner. Uh, let's share. This is a new, there we go. Okay. Tanner, you can see my screen okay, yeah? Absolutely. Cool. All right, let's get started. Um, Hey, we're really, really pleased to uh, spend some time with you all on a really key subject, which is uh, improving funnel throughput through analytics and coaching. Um, I'm Todd Abbott. I'm the CEO here at Insight Squared. Uh, those of you that don't know Insight Squared, 10-year-old uh, startup company that's been in the business of providing funnel analytics uh, for Salesforce.com customers um, uh, over the last 10 years. So I joined the company about 12, 18 months ago now. I'm an ex-CRO, been a CRO for the better part of uh, the last 25 years. Uh, Tanner, Tanner, why don't you uh, introduce uh, DSG? Yeah, I, uh, this is Tanner. I uh, lead sales and marketing for DSG. I've been with the firm for the past uh, 21 years and uh, spend a lot of my time working with CROs and heads of sales operations that are trying to improve revenue, improve funnel pipeline through uh, good coaching and good sales leadership. Uh, so between the two of us, uh, we want to share uh, more about perspectives um, uh, and lessons learned uh, and really the state of, of process and technology uh, to address some of the real fundamental vexing issues. Um, and I always like to start this chart up. This is a, a stat that uh, as an ex-CRO, I've seen this firsthand. Um, I've not experienced 16 months, but I certainly have seen it, um, especially with a lot of the customers that we deal with. And private equity VC-backed companies, the average tenure now uh, is 16 months. Um, and why is that? Well, I mean, fundamentally, it's about two key job requirements or two key priorities. As I like to call the first priority, it's job one. Uh, the tenure of a CRO is fundamentally predicated on, can you make your forecast? Uh, it's actually even more important than does the forecast make the goal. It's, can you make the forecast? Uh, and do you know what you're, what, how confident to be early in the quarter? If you're gonna miss, You've got to know early because surprises are just not tolerated from a CEO and from a board. Um, if you have the system and processes to consistently make the quarter, then it gets you to be able to drive to job two, which really drives um, much longer term tenure in the role is can you drive sustainable growth? But how do you do that with so many unanswered questions uh, that we just haven't had the data in the analytics to really support those two elements? Um, and that's what we really want to talk to you about today. Uh, so, Tanner, why don't you give some perspective on the day in life? Yeah, I mean, the, re the reality is you've got kind of two things happening at the same time. You've got the need to be a smart, you know, data driven sales leader. And at the same time, I think everybody's probably just nodding their heads as they look at all the little arrows around sales management and saying, yep, that's the world of a manager that's constantly trying to hit numbers and fight fires and report and drive accounts and drive deals. And they're the most critical asset for revenue acceleration, but it's just so uncommon that all the sales managers are properly trained to do a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. And if you go to the next slide, one of the reasons it's particularly challenging to evolve those sales leaders is they just get into a rut and it's a trap for managers as I talk to everyone every day about everything. I haven't worked with a client over the years, not ServiceNow, not Ring Central, Panasonic, Adobe, all the clients we've served, they all kind of come back to this common thread of sales managers, just by nature, you tend to talk to everybody all the time about everything. And because of that, you don't have leverage. 
And it's hard to be data driven. It's hard to be smart about the funnel and the pipeline and the forecast and the process when you're trying to get your, your, your finger on everything happening in the business, which kind of leads to the final point here is when you operate that way and that's your culture in the management ranks, it's hard to get a really high ROSL. And so ROSL stands for return on sales leadership. Lots of creative ways that we see clients measure. Am I getting a good return on sales leadership? What percentage of my salespeople on a given team are hitting quota? What percentage of the team are contributing the majority of the revenue? But you're looking at how can I help a manager see themselves as I need to get a high return on my coaching. If you go to the last slide here, um, it's the shift you're trying to get a first line manager to make is for many of them, they got into the role because they were a super rep. If they stay a super rep, they never get leverage. They never get high ROSL. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I've seen this a bunch of times and I would also um, just kind of uh, harken back to that first slide with all the arrows. As I often tell people that I've reported, I've promoted into a first line sales role uh, or am leading um, in, in whatever function, I, the first line sales job is the hardest role, I think, uh, in, in, in the company and frankly, um, in your sales career. Um, and it's the hardest because you've got three constituents that are kind of hitting you from all directions. Uh, obviously, the reps, the people you're managing, you're trying to grow and drive execution. Uh, you're also the first escalation point for customers. Um, and you've got to handle all of the uh, execution and challenges coming from above. And a lot of times those three pressure points just don't work. Um, and it, it creates a great deal of challenge. Uh, and those that are able to successfully manage through that and put process in place to be able to manage all those pressures are the ones that ultimately make the transition from being the super rep to being a super first line manager. Um, I think the other thing that I would share on this is that we're coming from a, a, a generation where uh, uh, historically B2B was about hiring that super rep, finding the next set of super reps. Um, and they came with their sales capabilities, they came with their contacts, with their uh, knowledge in the industry and the business. Um, and in fact, uh, we relied on them to go execute. And what's happening now is we're starting to drive much more of a process orientation into the sales process. We saw it starting with BDRs and inside sales, but it's now starting to also move up into the enterprise sales segment. That's part of a little bit about what we want to talk about today. Um, and so when you think about assessing a funnel, uh, we have historically used what I like to refer to as traditional sales map. Everybody's got some variation of this. You start the quarter, uh, you typically are looking at two different sets of metrics or dynamics to assess, am I in good shape this quarter? Uh, the first one I really talk about is sales capacity. How many reps do you have? How many new reps do you have coming online? What's the trajectory of getting them to be productive? How many months, quarters does it take? What do you expect from the new capacity that's coming online? Um, and what do you expect from each rep um, as an absolute number as well as percent of goal? And that's a that's a blend. So that's kind of like step one. Everybody needs to understand what's my capacity. If they all execute, they should deliver what? Uh, and then you then pivot to, OK, what do we have at the start of the quarter? Uh, and we have lived with funnel conversion, conversion against the number, the quota, the plan, uh, as well as conversion to be able to make your forecast. Hopefully your forecast and plan are the same, but not, sometimes they may not be. But do you have a good understanding of what your conversion is by the different categories in your funnel? And you may have different nomenclature. I've traditionally used commit, upside, and pipeline to, as different categorizations of confidence of a deal. Uh, but do you know what the conversion rates are um, as you go through the different categories? And pipeline typically is the lowest. Uh, I had a business uh, that I ran, a rather large business, where the conversion on pipeline, which is where reps tend to put a lot of stuff, uh, was less than two or three percent. Um, so do you know what those are? Um, sure. And do you have uh, enough funnel uh, to be able to make the quota and the forecast? And then you also typically now have, especially in the SaaS world, there's uh, what I like to refer to as uh, in period. So what is the amount of business you need to identify new leads within the forecast period, whether your forecast period is a month or a quarter, um, and I've got some customers that need to generate 40 to 60% of their business in period. Do you have the lead flow? Do you know what the lead flow needs to be to make that portion? 
So I refer to these as kind of basic sales math kinds of equations. And I know, Tanner, you've had a lot of experience on this, both within your business and consulting with customers as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, th this is this is where it all starts. And usually it doesn't deviate much from this. And so for a lot of organizations, even if they aspire to get beyond the most kind of basic math, they, this is still where it always starts. Yeah. So you, you've all got some version of this um, and there's challenges with it. Uh, and at the core of the of the challenges that is the hygiene of the data in CRM. And this is something that every sales leader has struggled with. Um, I know I certainly feel like I have a career built on doing funnel and forecast inspections and whether I've tried a carrot or stick approaches to get the reps to give us the data and have good, accurate data, it's an ongoing struggle. Um, and it's fundamentally an ongoing struggle because the ROI for the amount of time reps need to spend in your CRM system, it's just not there for them. And in fact, it's really not there for you as well. You want them to spend as much time uh, in front of customers uh, so there's always this, this point of conflict on getting hygiene as well as maximizing their time. And the reality is that we're only getting about 10 to 15% of the activity, the engagement activity of your team with your customers. And that's really in the best of circumstances. As we've deployed technology, we've validated this across a, a wide spectrum of customers. And that's really the core without, with, with us really not being able to assess what's the quality of this funnel. Uh, and so, you know, historically what your funnel conversion rates are. And we start every quarter. Do I have enough? And if you put enough pressure on your team to say, I've historically converted 33 percent. So I want three or I need three times coverage to start at a month or a quarter. You put enough pressure on your team. You'll get three times um, because they'll avoid the pain of not having it versus potentially giving you the truth. And so it then creates this dynamic that the forecast and funnel reviews have morphed into really becoming interrogations. They're inspections to try to find the truth. I, as a first line manager or as a CRO, what do I believe in this funnel that's going to convert that in essence, as a CRO, going back to the life of a CRO, am I going to bet my job on to be able to, to deliver and make the number? And so these interrogation processes, they're not fun for managers. They're not fun for reps. Um, and so uh, it, it also places a tremendous amount on your ops team. Your ops team is doing lots of di different dumps and uh, looking at those conversion rates and trying to assess. It's a very manual process. We're burdening revenue and sales ops, depending upon how you've structured your teams with an awful lot of manual analytics. Uh, and that's only getting 10 to 15 percent of the activity data. Uh, and so how do you assess the quality and the progression of the funnel? when we're dependent upon the reps moving things through the funnel and giving us updated information when there's not the ROI. This is the fundamental challenge that we've all been faced with, that there's now good news technology to address that. Uh, Tanner, anything you want to add? No, just I, I just takes you back to the whole talking to everyone about everything all the time. I, I think that is what's happening. And so much of it is about this kind of pipeline truth and you're depending on how much conversation and talking to everybody all the time to get it. And it'll never it'll never get you the outcomes you're after. That's right. And if you think about the amount of activity on your accounts, we put all the pressure on the sales rep to give us that data when you have lots of people touching the customer. But we don't we don't place the same burden on them. So how are the SEs right. engaging overlays or managers? Um, I can honestly tell you. Uh, I have never done a, an update to a Salesforce record, no matter how many times I might have engaged with the customer. It's not just not something we've thought about understanding and capturing when it, in fact, may have an opportunity or, or have an impact on the on the confidence of that deal. So yeah, exactly. that's kind of like a, a, a level set here on the problem statement. And I hope uh, that resonates with a lot of you, because uh, having been in this business for a long time and done forecasts and funnel reviews, which feels like an eternity. Um, I li I've lived a lot of that pain and I've gone into every quarter with a level of anxiety about am I in good shape or am I in bad shape? I might have coverage right this quarter, um, but but how does it compare with the quality for last quarter, the quality of the, the quarter before that? That's the fundamental challenge. And so we want to propose to you that there are really four strategies to really get at these, these issues. Uh, implementing a robust sales management system. We're going to talk about each three of these. Uh, diagnosing what uh, what the health looks like in your funnel, and there's different characteristics and different 
challenges that come with different funnel assessments, um, how to leverage uh, machine learning to get that engagement data and, and provide a different level of, of insights and analytics that do doesn't burden uh, your ops team. Um, and then translating all that to getting those interrogations and, and uh, inspections, getting them back to what they should be, which is coaching. So let's jump in. Uh, if I've learned one thing, uh, I, I think I've learned a lot, but if I've learned one thing, uh, this concept of a sales management system uh, and, and the discipline of which you run your management system, meaning the cadence, uh, and the underlying metrics that you use at different points in the management system is paramount. Um, I've learned that the, um, the management, what do I mean by a management system? A management system is a series of meetings. It's how you run the business. And if you run the business with a set of set meetings at a set cadence, it becomes the rhythm of the business because people will adjust, your team will adjust their behavior will adjust to what you're inspecting weekly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, if you do that consistently with the same set of metrics, that's how you drive behavior. And what I'm showing you here is an example of a sales management cadence for what I would call a shorter sales cycle, uh, a four to six, even up to eight weeks. Um, I've got a commercial business that's um, about just over 60 days. And this is very consistent with how uh, my sales manager runs that business. You're doing forecast one-on-ones once a week because there's that much movement and that much activity and progression that needs to take place. Um, the best practices is as well to do weekly stand-ups, a weekly update on how we're doing as a team where you're reviewing results, we're reviewing priorities uh, for this current week, uh, per, uh, reviewing results as to where we are in the 13 weeks of a quarter, um, and then you typically have a once a week process that's a roll up. How do you, what are you reviewing up into the chain? Uh, and then you may have MBRs, uh, monthly business reviews or quarterly business reviews that represents a different set of metrics, a different set of reporting and a different set of discussions. Uh, but the, the, fact, the ability to drive a set cadence and that cadence uh, would look differently if you had a longer sales cycle, 90 plus days. Uh, when you're when you're three three to six months, so our enterprise business has a five to six month sales process. There's no point and no need to do a weekly one on one uh, on an update relative to forecasting and funneling. You've got to allow the team to go spend time in front of customers. So there, it's a month one uh, of every uh, of every month. Month one, you're jumping in and do, doing an inspection on the forecast. Uh, we we've seen best practice. You separate out forecast from from pipeline. Pipeline is looking at next quarters because are you building enough funnel for next quarter? If you try to do it in one meeting, you tend to spend all your time on the tactical and not enough time on the strategic. So separating the two, uh, we have found to become best practice and drive the best behavior. Still do the weekly standup. You still have probably some type of a roll up into the executive leadership team and MBRs, QBRs and board meetings. So these are examples of what we mean by a set management case. But if you drive it with a level of consistency, um, it will fundamentally change the culture and the execution mindset of your team. Um, I know this is something you spend a lot of time with your customers with as well, Tanner. Anything to add? No, just this is the heartbeat. Like we have a, a client in Australia and the chief revenue officer has a few hundred sellers. And we, we just kind of navigated a project like this. But the cadence, he, he calls it the operating rhythm. And and the operating rhythm is exactly what you have here. There's 13 weeks in a quarter. It's the most critical meetings that happen by week. And then for him, like the operating rhythm is not just what are the meetings, but what's the coaching guide, the agenda, the topics, the coaching questions, the smart questions that are more than just how much and when. And when you get beyond how much and when in these in these meetings tied to this cadence, it's really powerful. And I couldn't point to a client over these last two decades that made progress in what we're talking about today, if they didn't have a cadence or an operating rhythm at the, at the core of it. And, and I think operating rhythm is the key. I mean, when you do it consistently every week one, um, every Monday, um, whatever the cadence is, if you do it consistently, everybody aligns to it um, and it just does become the heartbeat. It becomes the rhythm. The key is that uh, you have to stay on the rhythm. You don't take a week off. You don't take a month off. 
because it's just like you know in a car when when you when you take a week off or a month off that rhythm gets a little out of kilter um, and things start to get a little out of sync. Do it two two weeks in a row, two months in a row, you get way out of sync. So it really really is important. Um, let's talk about uh, that diagnosing overall funnel health, Tanner. Yeah, let's do it. Um, the uh, I think I'm going to start. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide and. Um, you know, when you think about a manager, whether you call it pipeline or you call it funnel, when you think about a manager and you say, hey, let's get focused on pipeline. I think for a lot of our managers, they turn that into a bunch of mini deal reviews. Like that's the activity they imagine in their mind is if I'm going to focus on pipeline, I'm going to do a bunch of mini deal reviews and that's going to help move things along, give me a view into what's really going on. When for a sales manager, if they just take the step back and they say, okay, it's not a it's not a series of many deal reviews. It's assessing is the pipeline healthy by seller. I'm a first line manager, and for each seller, look at the top. You kind of see the little labels here around the model. You've got quantity over the top of do I have enough going in? The far left, you've got velocity. Is it moving through quickly or is it stuck? Is it balanced or is everything in the top or the middle or the bottom? And then is it quality? Is it qualified opportunities that can even move through? Those become four really good ways to look at it. And the, the they come in all shapes and sizes. And so one thing that can help a manager is just having a model for, hey, you're going to see some pretty common characteristics of an unhealthy pipeline over and over again. And if you can help your seller see it visually and imagine why that's a problem and what to do about it. And, and these are, you know, these are kind of fun. They're memorable. Is it anemic? Is it top heavy? Is it bottom heavy? Is it bloated? But in each one of these, it's a very specific diagnosis of this is the problem for a seller and for a manager, they can remember this. So if we're trying to help a manager really get their mind wrapped around, I'm helping every seller improve the quality of their pipeline. And I'm looking at my whole team's pipeline, trying to say, is my whole team's pipeline healthy or unhealthy? These become four of the most common. What's helpful about this kind of a model, if you just think of this as like a training concept, like you're trying to train a sales manager on how to assess pipeline and coach their salespeople. If you just take one like uh, bottom heavy, like only a few major de deals at, at, you know, at late stage, that was to say deals, not details, um, but that's bottom heavy. And so for a manager, when it's bottom heavy, what do they need to be doing? They need to be meeting with a salesperson around, hey, let's talk about targeting. Let's talk about prospecting activities. Let's talk about your time strategy and how much time per week, because for them, it's all about what are they going to do to fill the top of the funnel? And that's their biggest problem. And so each of each one of these has what we would call a coaching cure. And we won't go into all those coaching cures today, but this does become a model that will bring clarity for a lot of a lot of sales managers. I, you know, I think it's a it, you know, we are wired graphically. And so for me, Tanner, I think this is a great way for each of you to think about your your uh, your assessment of the business, whether it's a rep a reps territory and funnel or a regions or, or your own, if you're a CRO and, or a yes. of ops, that each one of these um, drives focus. Uh, and so you're trying to stay one step ahead. Like if you were bottom heavy, you, you may feel really good about making this month or quarter. Yes. But that's not, if you're not focusing on fixing the root of that issue now, uh, then you're going to, you, you'll, you'll quickly move to the anemic. And so having this view to understand where to go focus strategically, I think is really the key point here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And so then this, this last side on, on kind of the, the, uh, the pipeline, so kind of a lens for managers to look, at, look through, kind of think of the left side as the health indicators. A lot of what Todd's kind of going to be continue to drive us towards is what is the most important data and how do you even visualize it? How do you get it consistently and can trust it? And then over on the right, it's the behavior, it's the mindset we want a manager to have of based on the health indicator on the left, what should I be doing to manage my pipeline, my sales team's pipeline, or all the way down the chain of the organization, depending on how big your team is. And so I'm not going to read all these activities, but it's really helping a manager connect there's data that I've got to understand and trust. And I'm turning that into very specific activities and actions that I consistently do and have the skill to do as a, as a sales leader. I know you helped kind of create this, Todd, any other comments you had on it? No, I mean, I think it's, it, 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 it resonated very well with me the way that I've always looked at it. I think the challenge we've all had is in the quality section. 
Mm -hmm. right? Very quantity driven, quantity of leads, quantity of opportunities, whether quantity is number or revenue. Um, that's the mindset that we've been focusing. If I have enough quantity, then I can execute through it. But the challenge is how do we assess quality and then do you do it consistently? That's what's really driving the velocity metric. So we've all been after the ability to execute better on quality and velocity. Um, and, and that's what I think we're really here to tell you is, is, to, is how to be able to do that more effectively. Yeah, and, and organizations everywhere are doing this in a way that's repeatable. Yeah. Like get the data right, the systems right on the left and train the managers right on the right side. And you can actually make a lot of progress really fast. Right. So let's talk about the third area, which is uh, and this kind of gets back to the uh, area that I, I talked about up in, in the early section here is how do you overcome the dependency on the rep um, to get the data? Because you, you need to have the data to be able to really do the quantitative analytics of your sales process. Where are you executing? Where aren't you holistically? But also, how do we get out of the, the, uh, the business of having to interrogate to validate confidence on a deal? That's just not high value activity for the rep or for you. And the way that, um, that you can now do that is the number one indicator of the health of the deal is the engagement between your team and the customer, right? It should be intuitive, but it, it, it's while it was intuitive to me, I've never really thought about it in this way until joining Insight Squared. Um, every sales process is a series of meetings. You're trying to get the customer to the next meeting. You have activity before the meeting, you have a meeting and then you have activity after to get to the next meeting. When customers see value um, in your value proposition, they will open your email, they will look at your attachments, they will commit to the next meeting. The moment they stop seeing value or are questioning it, the engagement level starts to drop off. Some of your best reps may be really good at understanding that and reacting, most don't. Uh, and so how do we really figure out how things are progressing without relying on your rep? Um, you have to have an ability to automatically capture all of that activity without putting more administrative burden on the rep, right? So how do we collect all of the digital engagement, the emails, the meetings, the file shares? There's now technology to be able to do that. And so if activity capture is a new concept for you, I strongly encourage you to really go do some research. Certainly we can help you out with that, but you've got to get the data from not just the rep, from every customer facing resource, because the more data you have, the leveraging then systems, you can't now get all that data and then go dump it to, to ops and say, go figure out what's what the trending is, what are the key activities? You're gonna need a machine learning engine because there's way too much data. Uh, automatic activity capture typically will add about uh, 10 times the amount of data you're currently capturing in your CRM system at an opportunity level. And so you're gonna need systems to be able to dis dissect that. When you do have that capability, you then start to be able to get what we like to refer to as an advanced sales map. And this is how you get to quality without having to interrogate. So this is an example of, of, uh, of a, one of our customers. Uh, just a quick orientation, the bars are the numbers of opportunities that close out either won or lost after each meeting. Right, so think about it again. Every deal is a, every sales process is a series of meetings. Um, every sales process I've seen with customers, there's always a few inflection points. And the inflection points are when you start to win, which is the, the line, which associates with the key off to the right. That's the win rate. And typically you don't win a lot. Um, I love to see when customers have this rapid drop off from qualification, you wanna qualify you know, quickly, like uh, you know, get the stuff out that's not qualified early. If you're taking three, four, five meetings to, to truly qualify before you have a drop off, you're consuming a lot of sales resource. Um, and so if you understand now what your sales process is and you understand what the engagement level is in between each meeting, now the system can tell you when that activity starts to drop off, which indicates a potential stall deal. Uh, and you want to be able to identify stall deals, not through interrogation, but through systems and providing that insight to the rep. So you can get that rep to be accountable now to understand, geez, I didn't think about that being stalled. But now that I look at it, I haven't heard from this customer for two weeks. I've got to jump back in and get that customer back. And how long do you keep it in the funnel before you classify it as dead? How much sales capacity are you going to consume uh, to be able to, to, to the rep hoping that they're going to get it back? 
And so as I look at uh, and engage with a lot of customers, every sales process in, in what I've seen typically has two inflection points. The first is getting through qual and discovery where you get into that building consensus stage to then where you get to a very high win rate. That's typically when the decision makers are in because the influencers have now sponsored you to where, uh, where the decisions now are really at the, at, at, um, at the ready. Um, and that's where you win incredibly well. So the key is how do you convert more early? If you think about it as meeting conversions, if you can improve the conversion rate early and get more business to where your team wins more effectively. But if you think about the interrogations that we do, um, this is another thing that, that just has been a big aha moment for me. Uh, the vast majority of deals you're inspecting or interrogating in funnel and forecast reviews are mid and late stage because yes. they're the ones that are going to help you get over the goal line. When in fact, if you spend more time on the front end of the funnel, getting more deals into where your team wins, the impact to your business is actually more significant. And so machine learning is a new vehicle to really get the data and provide that insights without having to do the interrogation and inspection. Uh, and now you can spend much more time getting back to coaching, which I know is something that's near and dear to your heart, Tanner. It is. And part of why that this partnership, I think, between Insight Squared and DSG is important is just that that concept of meeting conversion alone. I mean, so many of our clients, they they talk about conversion. They're just not thinking about it at a smart meeting conversion level and then saying, what can we learn? How can we improve those conversions meeting by meeting? And where should the time go? That's just so powerful. I don't see a lot of organizations getting that right. Amen. <laughs> um, increased sales management focus. So this, uh, this model here, you know, if you think about your managers, you know, where, you know, where does their time go? When do they really get management focus? you know, late in the quarter, like if, if you were to take every one of your managers, say where in the late in the quarter, where are they spending all their time? It's on the late stage deals. It's just, how do I fix the late stage deals? How do I make sure the ones that we can win, we do win because I have to hit my number. And if you go to the next one, but the, where they have the greatest ability to influence is early in the quarter where you can actually influence activity and creating the right opportunities and qualification. And that's when you can actually get mind share from a seller because they're not trying to get their deals done at the end of the quarter. So if you go to the last slide, you know, we call that the coaching window. And the whole idea is the coaching window is where with the right pre-planned conversations around pipeline and forecast and activity, um, forcing sellers to elevate their thinking and really focus on their activity, you can have a huge impact. You just got to recognize there is a coaching window and it's gone by the middle to the you know latter third of the, uh, of the cycle of a quarter. Yeah. And I think the, the other thing I would add is that, that if you've, if you've got the engagement data and the machine learning to be able to assess by rep, um, how do they do How are they doing in meeting conversions? Where are their inflection points? to get much more targeted on enhancing the weaknesses from an execution standpoint, rep by rep, as well as holistically. Um, th that's where you use systems now to not only coach by deal, but see the overall execution based on their conversion rates uh, to help them execute. And let's face it, every whether they're, you're a top rep or you're a, a new rep or a, a, or a bottom performing, everybody wants insights and coaching. Uh, the challenge is how do you get more personalized by having more personalized analytics and insights as to where each rep is executing in the sales process to help them grow, develop, and deliver better results. Um, and so the machine learning uh, ability to help you in that coaching window um, is stronger than it's ever been. That's right. And I think organizations have to assess, if you think about your manager or team, like, what, and usually it's both, but it is the issue to solve for right now is they just don't have the data. Like we're really, this all sounds great. They just don't have the data visibility. And if they did, had they been trained to how do I, what do I do with it? How do I coach with it? How do I change my mindset of how I lead my team? Because for some sales managers, even if they have it, they still got to like think differently about their job. Like it's a different job than what I thought it was. And there's a much better way to do it. That'll have a much bigger impact. So Tanner, I want to give you an opportunity to do a, 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 a short commercial because I think it's too, you have a, a, an awful lot of really cool 
uh, value add uh, in the DSG portfolio, but the, the coaching uh, guide, uh, pipeline coaching guide, and some of the other tools, I I, uh, I am a big believer in, and I want to I want to give you an opportunity to share with the uh, with the attendees here some of the things you can do. Yeah, I mean, even if it's not through our app, there's a lot of power in taking best practice and what good looks like for a sales manager and putting it into a kit. You know, we call it a playbook. It's a video based playbook. But even like you see on your screen here, like imagine the guy in the video is one of your best sales managers talking about pipeline coaching and down below are questions and structure and an agenda for how to run a pipeline review that takes a lot of the mystery out of, oh, that's what good looks like. That's how I elevate my game. That's how I really get the highest and peak performance out of my team. And you're taking everything from a deal review to an account review, a pipeline review, a forecast review, and coming up with best practice for your organization. Because like if right now I rattled off like all the things that I think have to happen a pipeline review, two thirds of that, you'd be like, yeah, 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 sure. But there'd be a third of that. You'd say, no, 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 no. There's some nuance in our business. How we do things is different and you need that bespoke playbook or kit that's video based that enables your management team to learn how to do it. And so this is just an example. It's a screenshot from one of our clients, but what does a pipeline coaching guide look like? The next screen is an example of a deal coaching guide and uh, just trying to make it make it real. Uh, I, I think it's it's good stuff. And if you want to learn more um, from uh, the playbooks and uh, and how to implement a system to provide or to build that coaching culture, uh, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, to go to the dsgteam.com uh, slash sales coaching website. A lot of good material. Want to learn more about uh, machine learning and how to leverage that to capture and analyze engagement data to provide deal specific insights, as well as assessing the overall quality of your funnel. Um, I submit to you what where we're moving to with this new machine learning capability is the funnel coverage at basic sales map is going to become less relevant. Um, what you really need is a system that is able to take your existing funnel based upon the current engagement level in each of those deals and give you a predictive set of analytics that says, what is this funnel going to deliver? Uh, that's going to change the game relative to some of the basic sales math approaches that we've been using for a long time. And if you want to learn more, uh, come to the insightsquared.com website. We'd be happy to, uh, to, to give you some more material. Um, so what we want to do now is uh, open it up uh, for, for questions and answers. Um, let me stop sharing for a moment here and, uh, and get to the questions. Uh, and i got to figure out how to stop sharing because I can't see the message board. Uh, sorry, folks, but this is a new system for us, and I've got to figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to leave it there because I can't figure it out. <laughs> um, let's. Uh, we've got a couple questions that have been loaded in. Uh, if you've got a question, please uh, please pop it into the uh, the question board. There's an ask a question down below. And uh, the first question is, what is better, a monthly cadence or a quarterly cadence? Uh, the answer is it really depends upon your sales process or your sales cycle length, I should say. Um, if you've got, you know, in my estimation, if you've got a 60-day sales cycle, and it might be 62, 63, or 48, but if you're in that range, uh, it should typically translate to you wanting to have a monthly cadence because you're you want to inspect it every week. Uh, with a with a monthly mindset. If you've got a longer sales cycle, we typically see this in enterprise selling. And I really put this at kind of 90 days plus. And so in that 60 to 90, it really depends upon your business. Uh, that's when I've seen it's best that you go to a, um, a quarterly cadence, but driven by month. Um, and so how do you think about your forecasting? Um, so I have two businesses as an example. I've got an enterprise and a commercial. My enterprise uh, team is very quarterly. While they look at things monthly, uh, it's actually a six month comp plan. It's a six month quota. And we look at things very much on a current quarter, current quarter plus one. My commercial business is 60 day sales cycle. And those guys are really looking at this current month, current month plus one. Asking them to forecast and build a funnel, a funnel that's out 90 days, that's just not the right orientation to their business. Doesn't mean they don't have funnel out there. We look at it, 
but it's very much a 30 day. So the answer I would give you is it really depends upon the length of your sales cycle. Tanner, I could add, yeah, sure. That comment I would make is sometimes we'll have clients where the, because of the nature of the business, they have to think about pipeline and forecast in a real detailed way monthly, but there's other parts of your cadence that may not make sense monthly. So like doing an annual kind of like a, like a quarterly sales team, just audit and assessment of their skills, doing a quarterly business plan and strategy for the quarter and activity. There's a number of things that you may want to put into your cadence that really need to be at a quarterly level. And that's why you have to go through that, that process of debating it internally and getting the right sales leaders and sales ops people in a room to really debate, like what's the ideal cadence? Everything you said, Todd, made a lot of sense to me. Uh, next question is, uh, what does good look like from a stage by stage metrics standpoint at the start of a quarter versus mid quarter versus end of quarter? Um, I'm going to answer that question with a, with a response that I probably wouldn't have given you six to nine months ago, and it may be viewed as a bit controversial. Um, but when I look at my funnel now, um, I don't really focus on sales stage. Uh, and the reason I don't is because I've also learned that uh, if sales reps are bad at adding new uh, contacts to CRM, they're actually even worse at keeping things in the right stage. And so the, the, the funnel stage metrics are, are questionable in, in most of my customers and I would submit to you most of yours. Uh, as I've moved to an engagement model analytical view, um, everything is really about where are you in the numbers of meetings that typically correlate to stages and are you getting the engagement level? Uh, so I look at uh, engagement level on committed deals or late stage deals to really assess health versus what's the mix uh, of my funnel by stage that translates to a, a quality metric. It, you, it's, it's not good strong data. Um, uh, you may be one and unique that you think you've got really good accurate hygiene on sales stage. If that's the case, you would be unique. Most companies really struggle with this because you're dependent upon the reps. Um, and so looking at this based upon engagement is a much better translation to quality than looking at the portfolio and what your funnel stage uh, conversion rates are. Tanner? Yeah, we definitely, this is one of the more common topics when we're building sales management systems and building coaching frameworks. We'll typically try to, with every client, shift them to a customer buying milestone model that's tied to these meetings. But you're saying kind of what, as a manager, it really doesn't matter what stage you said it's in. What matters is the buying milestones that the customer went through that I can verify. They actually did this step. They completed this. They asked for this. They confirmed that. And that would be another layer um, that I would say gives you a lot more visibility into what's real in the pipeline than just what stage are we in. Yeah. Uh, next question is, how long is too long before there's no engagement and a deal should be closed lost? It's a great question. The answer is it really depends an awful lot on what your advanced sales math is. Um, in longer sales cycles, you'll probably have a little bit more time before you would declare a deal as stalled. I mean, that's the first indication you want before you get to the point of identifying it's lost, you want to first identify where is a deal stalled and stalled is the customer has stopped engaging. They've stopped responding to your emails. They've not scheduled the next meeting. They're not opening your attachments. Um, that is potentially a deal that's stalled. And so um, in those shorter sales cycles, it's within a week or two because you've got that many engagements kind of going through a 60 day process. In a longer sales cycle, it might be three or four weeks, it really kind of depends. But what you need is a machine learning model that helps you understand what is the engagement uh, profile look like on a winning deal that will tell you um, when, uh, how frequent th those, those contacts should be. And the frequency would be different for a new business than it would be for renewal, than it would be for cross-sell. Each one of those deal types has different engagement profiles. And what you want is a system that helps you identify in your historic, when you win math, uh, when should you be concerned? And how do you leverage a system to prompt the rep and the manager to a deal that maybe is at risk of going stale or uh, when in fact it's dead? Like I'll, I'll give you a good example. I had a customer the other day um, in their math, uh, they didn't win one deal after three pushes. Um, and so if you know that, then as you get to the third push or the fourth push, odds are should be like a red alert. 
or you typically all have a sweet spot when you win the highest and then it slopes off and you hit a point where you don't win very often or, or not at all. I had another customer who didn't win a deal after a hundred days in a shorter sales cycle and yet had lots of opportunities that were over a hundred days. That's wasted sales capacity. So when you did to decide to, to, to identify a deal as dead, uh, really is very customer sales cycle, advanced sales math dependent. Uh, next question is, should SQL, should SQLs, excuse me, not SQL, should SQLs be forecasted in the pipe with a weighted percentage? Um, really good question. Um, we, um, the, so the answer I would give you is yes. Uh, but the weighted percentage uh, really is based upon engagement level and 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 that machine learning analytics. Um, this, a good system will weight it for you uh, by understanding how quickly things progress, uh, what the engagement level is in the early stage. Uh, a good system will give you the proper weighting. Uh, but yeah, I had a customer the other day who actually didn't start measuring his funnel until they got to uh, a, 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 a demo stage. Uh, and they were missing all of the front end of the funnel. And the logic was, I just want to look at quality. I don't want to look at the lack of quality um, uh, or, or what is still really too early stage to understand what's real. And my pushback on that was, well, then you're losing all of what's the engagement data look like and what does good look like in converting early stage to get to that demo. If you're not really analyzing that early stage, then how are you able to improve the conversion rate to get more business into when you execute? So a good machine learning model will, will weight the early SQLs. And so in our business, as soon as a deal is qualified by a BDR, uh, I don't make it optional. I make it, this is now an SQL. Now there's still some that get kicked back, but when I measure kickback, I can now drive the execution between BDRs and sales to make sure I'm only getting good. But I want, I want to be able to track engagement and progression immediately when something is identified as an SQL. Tanner? I've got nothing to add to that. That was great. <laughs> um, what areas should sales managers focus on for reps to set them up for success and consistent quota attainment? Got an opinion on that one. Yeah, especially during their ramp period, the first six months. Go ahead. Why don't you take it? I, I think it's role specific, right? And, and sometimes we, we start out with just competencies instead of outcomes and saying during the first six months for an SDR versus an account manager versus an account executive, it really is going working backwards from the outcome they have to achieve in that six months. If you're an SDR and, or even an account exec and the first six months is all about building pipeline, then the sales manager should be focused on what's the learning, the skills, the messaging, the tools that are going to give them the confidence and get them doing the right activities to build pipeline. But I think starting with outcomes versus starting with competencies is so, so important. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and it's one that I, as a CRO, have, have frankly struggled with um, in giving direction to my enablement or my onboarding team. Uh, by not really understanding what does great look like from an execution standpoint. Like I always knew who my top 10%, 10% reps were. Uh, and I, I many times have tried to go uh, survey them or have somebody spend some time with them to try to capture what are they doing differently? Because if you could capture what your top 10, 20% reps do, and when I say what do they do, how do they engage? How do they effectively qualify? How are they communicating? What's going on in the meetings? What information are they sharing? Like, how are they executing? In fact, when you sit down with a good rep and say, what are you doing that's so good? It's so intuitive to a lot of them. They don't think about uh, things they really should be telling you. Uh, the beauty of an automatic activity capture and a machine learning model is I can tell you exactly what your best reps are doing. I can tell you how, what, they're, what material they're using, what the cadence is, how they're communicating. So your ability to capture that now and think about bringing on some new reps to say, this is what great looks like. This is how you execute. This is how you qualify and discover and get through to the demo and into negotiation. Um, if you've got a good, good picture of, of what great looks like, not only does it help you with onboarding, but it also helps you with moving the bell curve of execution for your broad sales team. And so your onboarding and enablement team 
uh, they love this kind of data because now they can translate it to uh, to the, the the playbooks, right, of what execution looks like. Uh, and that's where uh, where guys like DSG can really help you out. Yeah, because your, your salespeople need a playbook as much as the managers do. The manager playbooks about the coaching and the cadence and the how to be a good leader. The sales playbook is how do I get a meeting? How do I qualify? How do I lead an amazing first call? How do I create a solution recommendation tied to the customer's outcomes? How do I do it the way that our top rep does it where it's compelling and it's insightful and it's consultative? But all that needs to be a playbook. And if there's a playbook for a seller, that makes it so much easier for a manager to say, look, here's your kit. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to coach you. But there's a playbook for that seller that helps them get ramped. Uh, that's right. And you know, the other thing I would share is that um, you know, new reps, uh, they'll typically subscribe to the fake it till they make it kind of approach. Mm -hmm. and they don't know what a stall deal looks like. They're still, they're learning. They're taking your training, but they're learning. Um, and if you can help them as, as their manager identify a potentially stalled deal and jump right in to help coach them through that process at the key inflection points in the sales cycle, uh, how powerful is that? Uh, a lot of times those new reps don't know that, that not hearing back for two weeks um, is a red flag or, or worse yet, they're hiding. They're trying to get that customer back. They might've had two or three meetings. They can't get them to respond. They may be hiding that, in fact, they can't get the customer back on the on the phone or back into a meeting. Uh, and so they'll give you a story inside. They know they're a little bit anxious that this is this deal real. The beauty of a good machine learning is, is it just it pulls the curtain back and it allows the rep to get prompted. It allows you as a manager to know how are these new reps doing converting meetings? Where are they struggling? And it allows you to know exactly which deals you can jump into to go focus on because you know where you've got stalled or, or dead deals. And, and so the coaching you can give those new reps to help get them on board and uh, executing to great is, is, uh, is really uh, highly leverageable. So uh, hey, great questions. Um, great. I really appreciate uh, everybody taking some time. We always, Tanner and I always have, you know, we have similar philosophies. We like to end these early. Uh, to give you back a little bit of time, hopefully, you know, give you five, six, eight minutes and before that next Zoom meeting. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time. It's a it's a, a privilege for you to dedicate uh, the amount of time you have to to hear our thoughts and perspectives. Uh, as as we said, if you've got uh, additional uh, information requests, come to each of our sites. Feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to engage with any follow up questions or perspectives. Uh, we're really here to help you execute um, much, much better leveraging technology and systems. Tanner, any closing comments? No, this is a lot of fun. Good to, good to do this with you. And I, uh, I think uh, I'm even coming in with a couple of things I want to be applying. We've been a customer for a long time. But every time I talk, I, I, I realize a couple more things that I know we need to be applying. There you go. Hey, good. everybody. Thank Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.